Hey everybody, my name is Kerwin Ray and I'm a high performance specialist specializing in growing businesses very quickly. And you are on the fitness and lifestyle podcast. Welcome to the fitness and lifestyle podcast. I'm your host, Danny Kennedy, and I'm here to help you become the very best version of yourself. Kerwin, welcome to the Fitness and Lifestyle Podcast, brother. It is an absolute pleasure to have you on today, mate. Really appreciate your time. Um, you're someone who I've been inspired by um, a lot over the years and I've consumed much of your content and I feel like you just have so much value to offer in, in so many different areas, which I'm looking forward to getting stuck into today, man. But um, thanks, mate, firstly, welcome to the show and, and appreciate your time. Mate, thanks for having me. And with a name like Danny or Dan Kennedy, mate, it's uh, you, you're sharing a, a strong a strong presence. Do you know Dan? Yeah, you heard, yeah. I do. I wish I wish I could say I was um, an eighth of the marketer he is, but um, we're <laughs> yeah, getting there. A, yeah, mate, that's great. <laughs> mate, we we've had uh, Dr. John D. Martini on the podcast a couple of times, who I know you're nice. quite close with. And and our first episode, one of the main messages that he was pushing was that your values will will determine your destiny. Mm -hmm. Now. Someone like yourself who um, has been through, I guess, many different stages of life and you've, you've reached the peaks of peaks with, with the business and, and I would assume as well in terms of happiness as well. And at the same time, you've been in some pretty low moments, um, in particularly over these last few years. I'm curious as to when you felt like you're at the highest of highs in comparison to the lowest of lows, what were the values that you were really portraying or the perspectives that you, you had in both of those times? What was the difference between those two moments? Mate, I don't think my values, and I don't, I, I, I am of the belief that I don't think values fundamentally change. I think they evolve over time with experience. Uh, and so I don't think there's necessarily a, a shift in the values that I've had in the experience of the highest of the highs or the lowest of the lows. It's probably been more in, um, and it's maybe not necessarily the answer that you're looking for, but it's more, more the interpretation of the experience. And so one of the things that I've realized is, you know, values to me are an important driver. They're like a motive. They're why we do what we do. And, you know, the motives that we have um, really fundamentally determine the things that we do, but also the level of drive and motivation that we have. And that's why for me, you know, people often talk to me about motivation. I say, well, look to me, motivation's not in a book. It's not in a seminar. It's within yourself. It's knowing who you are. And the more you understand what a value is, which is a motive, the more you understand that, that your values are the doorway to motivation. And the more you understand about yourself and the more clarity you have around your values, um, the greater access you have to flow, the greater access you have to um, natural sources of motivation, which aren't aren't augmented or required to be adjusted by, you know, caffeine or substance or, or anything. And so to me, happiness is, is not necessarily, I don't think happiness can be a value. Um, and it's just put my personal opinion. I think happiness for the most part is a perspective that we hold in the experiences that we're, that we're interpreting. And so for me, you know, when I look at the difference between the highest of highs and the lowest of lows is, and that's when you ask about the highest of highs, like it's a really interesting question because I'm not someone who historically is someone who gets very excited. I'm not someone mm -hmm. who gets what I would put in the category of overjoyed. You know, I'm quite a, for the most part, quite a neutral person. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's not that I don't feel happiness or fulfillment. I do, but it's in a very subtle sense. It's not in yep. this extrinsic, high vibratory, excitable, expressive, you know, it's very, it's very contained within, within myself. Um, and similarly, you know, when I talk about the lows, lowest of lows, cause it's so interesting, you know, I know we touched on before the podcast and I've had a really challenging, you know, coming on now, or oh, I'm, I'm, I'd like to say I'm out of it now, but you know, let's call it, I had a really challenging 18 months and it was the most challenging period of my life bar none. And that's a, that's a pretty big comment. Um, and for those people who don't know me, it would mean nothing. But for those people who do, they would know I've been through a lot. You know, I've had, I don't even want to count anymore. Like it's eight or nine near death experiences. You know, I've had a lot of, I've had a very big life. And so for me to sit here and say the last 18 months has been the hardest of my life. It's a, it's a pretty big statement. Um, but what was really interesting is from the outside looking in, you know, I still remember one day when I got back to Byron and I was in a, a really deep, 
dark, horrible depression. And this is for someone who's never experienced a day of depression in their life. To give you a bit of backstory, I had a stroke in 2021, um, which was quite a massive stroke, uh, followed by heart surgery. And then I caught COVID in my recovery. And I just, I just got really banged up. My neuroendocrine system was completely thrown out. And so I went from being this very resilient, very um, sturdy, rugged, strong, capable individual to being completely crushed by life. Um, mm. I was darkly depressed. I was obsessively suicidal. Um, and that was a real shock to the system because for me, I'd never experienced a day of depression in my life. I'd never considered end of life because I'm a very, you know, I'm an, I'm a very committed dad. And the idea of leaving any of my children behind, you know, is just not something that I would ever consider. So to be in that state was, was, was pretty traumatic. And I know this is a big answer to the question, but the reason I share that the context is because I still remember one day when I was in, I came back to Byron after spending six weeks in a recovery program, trying to put my brain back together, trying to put my body back together. I'd lost 17 kilos. I looked like a cancer patient and I bumped into a friend and I had no idea what was going on. Anyway, seven months later, eight months later, a year later, I can't remember what it was. Um, I bumped into them again. I said, oh, you had no idea how I was in a such a fucking dark place that day. And they literally said to me, I had no idea. Jeez, you put on a good act. And I remember thinking to myself, and it didn't really hit me till after act. I was like, fucking act. Are you serious? Like, <laughs> I was, uh, there was no act. I was, you know, I was deeply ashamed, deeply embarrassed because I thought you saw me. And, um, mm. and so again, you know, I think happiness is one of those things, our lowest of lows. It really is an interpretation of the experiences that we're having. And so for me, the difference between the lowest of the lows, there was no difference between my values at my lowest mm -hmm. point and my values at my highest point, I guess the only difference being is my values at my lowest point are really what helped me recover. They really are what yeah. helped me get better because I value health. I value growth. I value, you know, a sturdy and a strong psychology. I value setting an incredible example for my children. Um, and so for me, the values didn't change. Uh, my perspective of life at the time, my interpretation of life in both those instances were quite different. Um, but it was the values that fundamentally drove me from the bottom back up. And I guess the values at the top in, my, in the highest points of my life are what kept me grounded, you know, cause I'm not mm -hmm. someone who, as I said, I don't get overly excited. I'm not someone who celebrates overly. I don't go and, you know, buy watches or cars or expensive things when I'm, you know, super duper excited. You know, I like to stay neutral. I like to stay grounded. I like to stay, you know, in my body and present. I'm interested when you were at the lowest of lows, I'm assuming and can correct me if I'm wrong, but you, it may have been, there may have been a period where you almost lost sight or found it hard to put focus on those values would have been hard lost to total sight, yeah. complete lost myself, like actually lost myself. Like I remember, I can't tell you how many times I would, I, I couldn't even watch social, couldn't even go on social media because if I saw a video of myself pop up, I'd burst into tears because I didn't recognize that person anymore. Mm. Like I couldn't see, I couldn't access that person. You know, I'd see this person on stage who was confident and strong and knowledgeable, and intelligent. And I had almost no executive function and, mm. you know, and so I, and I had nothing. And so for me, it was, you know, it was quite a traumatic experience to see that. I'm sure there's people listening or watching at the moment that, um, you know, maybe they're in a similar position. Maybe it's not as severe, um, you know, depending on how they perceive it as well. But for people who have also lost sight of what their values are, I'm interested to hear what were the things that allowed you to start to gain some clarity on those values again and start to actually feel them again and work your way back into, you know, I guess to value the values again and, and to really start to let them show as part of who you were. I think it was more of a, a journey back to allow the values to be the lens. Mm. Um, and it was an interesting scenario because, you know, I'm someone who's done, you know, tens of thousands of hours of work and learning and development. And I'm sure I'm not alone. I'm sure there are plenty of people listening to this podcast who've done equal amounts or more. But what I found really interesting is in the darkest of the times that I was in recently, um, nothing worked. Like mm -hmm. the Martini method didn't work. A fucking anchor yeah. didn't work. There was nothing like there was nothing in this enormous you know, psychological toolbox that I had, nothing worked. And again, that's a really humbling place to be where you've got this huge body of knowledge, this huge body of experience, but nothing worked. And so what it actually forced me to do was to find new ways, look for new tools, tools that I hadn't yet discovered. But there was one tool, um, I guess you could say, it's kind of linked to a value, but it's more linked to a practice, which was the practice of, 
of, of self-discussion, you know, of self-conversation, of self-talk. And really, you know, I've got a very high value on presence, a very high value on awareness, on awareness. And so for me, you know, really starting to listen to the conversations that were going on in my head and then interrupting them and recalibrating them with new language was a, was a pretty big, what I'd call a uh, foundational piece early for me to, you know, start the recovery process. When I look at you from the business side of things, and then I, I look at you from a lot of this psychological mindset, personal development aspect as well. And I know there's, there's obviously a lot of crossover between the two. Do you feel like you are predominantly of like the masculine energy in comparison to, to the feminine energy side of things? And the reason I ask that is I'm wondering whether like how much focus or attempt or intention you put towards things like frequency daily in terms of when you're waking up in the morning, are you intentionally trying to choose what frequency you want to be at for the day? Or do you rely more so on the masculine things of just doing the things to put you in the, the place that you need to be in mentally? Well, I don't think masculine isn't a frequency. I think, I don't, I think it's all frequency. Um, mm. And I think sometimes we can overthink life to a degree and to the point where, you know, we end, our life ends up being, you know, a combination of intersecting routines and practices. Um, but for me, it's not that I, it's, I don't wake up and sit there and go, okay, my intention today is to be masculine or my intention today is to be soft and feminine. You know, if anything, I wake up and my intention every day is to just be as connected with myself as I possibly can and express from that place. And so rather than trying to, you know, create a quote unquote, um, intended or what I'd call a false persona to lead with the day. Like my goal is just to be as authentic and as real as possible. And sometimes, and that's, you know, been part of this learning is learning that it's okay to be softer. It's okay to be more vulnerable. Um, it's okay to, you know, um, have moments where you don't feel good and that's okay as well. And so intentional about how I want to show up. Um, once upon a time, I would have said very much yes. Whereas now my intention is very much more around um, really being in touch with myself and really coming from that place and not trying mm -hmm. to be something in a moment that I'm not just because I think it's going to give me an outcome that I'm looking for. Do you feel like there's, there's lessons that you took from being in that dark place and, and working your way back out, you know, using some of the examples of the stuff you've just mentioned to us now, do you think there's lessons that you learned from that, that could have been learnt through personal development if you hadn't have experienced them yourself <laughs> oh fuck honestly i could have learned almost every single lesson if i just fucking listened to my body in the first place because my body was like i knew what was look if i look back on the whole experience i knew what was coming and i ignored all the symptoms all the signals i ignored all the senses i ignored all the input from my body um that created this outcome that fundamentally led me back to this huge process of getting back into myself and listening to my body, being more embodied. And, you know, if there's one lesson that I've taken away from this entire experience and as I'd categorize in one word, it's embodiment. I'm, I've learned how to become a lot more embodied and a lot more um, attentive to uh, the needs, the wants, but more importantly, the sensations that are moving through my body and allowing those sensations to be rather than trying to distract myself from those sensations or detract mm -hmm. myself from, th from those sensations or even deflect some of those sensations. And so, yeah, probably one of the biggest lessons I've learned is learning how to be in my body and listen to the body. And could I have learned that through personal development? I thought I had, I honestly thought I had, um, but I'm, I'm one of these personalities. I'm one of these souls, Danny, where, um, my soul loves to do things in a very big way. Like my soul doesn't like to necessarily grow slowly. Like my soul, and I say soul because I look at my whole entire existence and I could talk about it as my personality, but I know there's something deeper within me, um, that is here for something, um, great. I know that I can sense that. And, but it's not a, it's not a personality trait. It's not a, it's not necessarily even a value. It's not because it's not based on an acquisition of something. It's based on this desire to experience. Um, and so for me, yeah, I thought I had a sense of embodiment, but it was just nowhere near what I, what it is today. 
but in order for me to get to where I am, where I am today, I had to go through a very rapid ascension of, um, I know I put it into two categories, a very rapid descent, mm -hmm. which was followed by a very rapid ascent. And so there was this okay. very rapid descension into total and utter death. And I mean that not just in terms of a psychological concept of thinking about death. Like I went through, you know, they talk about the dark night of the soul, you know, Joseph Campbell's got an incredible, you know, model around looking at the circle of life and how we go through these lives and then we die and we're crucified and then we're reborn and we take through with us the elixir from our previous lives to our next life. And I literally lived 365 days of, you know, the dark night of the soul I had 365 of those. And so for me, I went through this very rapid descension into a very, very dark place where I was completely stripped of all personality, all intelligence, all physical capability, all mental capability. Like I was a walking, almost a walking vegetable, you know, you know of skin and bones. And, um, and then from that place, I had to go through this, this rebuild. Like I went through this rebuilding phase where I started to rebuild my body. I started to rebuild my brain. I started to rebuild my sense of self. Like who the fuck is, who the fuck is Kerwin Ray? You know, and I didn't want to look to a, so I didn't want to look to videos on social media because that was just one aspect, you know, and that's what a lot of people yeah. don't realize is when, when you see someone on social media, that's one aspect, you know, it's, and in many cases, it's even the highlights reel. And I fell into that, that trap as well with social media where it became my highlights reel, you know, where I had this huge period of, you know, um, outward expression on social media, which was very authentic and very real, which was characterized in the documentary style of content. But then as I moved away from that, I moved more into the social content and the, socialistic aspects of, you know, portraying, you know, all the yeah. good things. And so after this rapid dissension, I went through this rapid ascension and the only way I could probably categorize is, is I feel like I did 20 years worth of work in 18 months. You know, I probably did, you know, 10 years of therapy in that period of time. And by the way, and by therapy, I was doing equine therapy. I was doing embodiment therapy, psychotherapy, art therapy, constellation therapy, family systems therapy. Like, fuck, man, I was picking every scab. I was, I was kicking every hornet's nest because I was just at this place. Where I was just like, I just, you know, there's some, there's, I don't want to go back here. And so there's something that needs to be done. And so, yeah, for me, yeah, for whatever reason, my soul just has this contract to do things rapidly and, and intensely. Mm. I know back in the day you were a PT, am I right? Yes. PT back in the day, yeah. Obviously, Long time a, ago. Large percentage, a large percentage of this audience are uh, you know, super interested in fitness and, and want to take their health and fitness seriously and, and are aiming to be that best version of themselves. What part has physical fitness played in getting you back to, to where you are right now in terms of that journey back to getting back to full health, both physically oh, and mentally. Like, is that a, a big aspect of your routine now? Huge mate. Because again, when I came back from my, you know, my six week in, intensive recovery, which was, you know, the equine and everything else, um, I had no, like I've got, I live in a house right now in Byron on the beach where I've got 42 stairs between my bedroom and the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like, oh my God, that sounds like, it's like fucking, it was hell <laughs> because if I got to the kitchen and I forgot something, it was 160 stair round trip and I had almost no executive function and I, and I had the memory of a goldfish. And so I was forgetting shit constantly. <laughs> and so I was doing like a thousand stairs a day and I was exhausted. And so I was like, okay, I need to build myself back up again. Um, and so I started with a rebounder. And I remember I had a mate who came down from, came up from Sydney. He's like, oh, we'll put together a little training program for yourself. And, and it was so, you know, in hindsight, it's kind of funny and comical. You know, I would say it's embarrassing, but it was where I was at at the time. It started with, okay, let's get you on the rebounder and we'll warm you up. And after 30 seconds on the rebounder, I was absolutely exhausted and I couldn't do it anymore. Like legit, could not do another thing. And so then the next day we did, you know, 20 seconds on the rebounder. And then I did five different exercises, one set each. And those five different exercises, one set each took me an hour and a half to complete. And as someone who comes from quite a, you know, a physically intensive background as a PT, as a power lifter, as a bodybuilder, as a combat sports participant, you know, mm -hmm. I, I'm someone who likes to train hard and is used to being able to train hard and then being in this place where I couldn't, it was really confronting, but it was a beautiful and a beautiful, but also a very 
it was a necessary part of my, my recovery, because one of the things that I realized that's important for anyone who's coming back from someone is to be able to recognize and acknowledge progression. Because I Mm -hmm. think sometimes when we're in a dark place, if we're not making progress, it just adds to the story of the darkness. And so for me, you know, as I said, 30 seconds and rebound it exhausted. So next day, 20 seconds followed by five single exercises took me an hour and a half. And I remember at the end of it being, feeling so embarrassed, but I was like, you did it, you've done it. It's there. But within a week I was doing 45 seconds on the rebounder. And then I was doing the five exercises and and I'd added, I think an extra six reps to each exercise. And then within a month I was doing five minutes on the rebounder and I was doing, you know, 10 different exercises and then two sets each. And then, gosh, I think it took me probably six months to get to the point where I could go back and actually start training with my PT again. And we were training Mm -hmm. three times a week. And again, all I was doing was balance work. So I was doing very neurofunctional repatterning, you know, balance coordination, you know, no, very little fitness or cardio or, 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 um, strength intensity. It was very, very mild, but then, and so this is going back now, fuck, it's not even that long. So we're talking January this year, February this year. And then by, uh, September this year, I was training five days a week again and, you know, training relatively hard. So I know I'm the king of, you know, tangent long answers, but in a nutshell, it, it played a huge role in my recovery. But for the main reason of creating a psychological benchmark of progress. Yeah. And this is where, you know, to me, all forms of training, you know, whether it's training in the gym or training in the relationship or, you know, training as a parent, everything, everything in life is a training. And when we can recognize progress, which is the progression, it builds confidence and that confidence builds fuel and that fuel adds to the motives and, you know, enables us to, um, amplify those values in a way that, you know, drives us towards something that is meaningful to us as a, as a soul or a personality, depending on how you look at it. I absolutely love that. Uh, that's incredible takeaway for, for so many different aspects. I wanted to circle back the circle back quickly. Sorry. Um, you mentioned equine therapy. It's yeah. not something that I'm super familiar with. Are you happy to yeah. explain a little bit about what that is? Yeah. I'll do my best. I won't, I don't know if I'll nail it. Equine therapy. Well, is I don't an, know about it. So whatever you say, I'm going to think well, you nailed it anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> equine therapy is a really potent therapy. Um, essentially, it's where you walk into, well, the equine therapy that I did, because there'll probably be someone who listens to this who goes, that's not equine therapy. My version of equine therapy is this. And so my version of equine therapy that I did, and I only did like maybe, I think it was a dozen or 15 sessions. But if we go back to the horses, like horses are an incredible animal and they have probably one of the largest um, um, torus fields of any mammal. And the torus field is essentially the field that is created by the heart. And so when the heart, the a heart has an, an enormously powerful electromagnetic field, like the human heart has an electromagnetic field that is about, um, I think it's about four to five times stronger than the brain. And that electromagnetic field, um, it carries information, but also receives it, receives information and a horse's, um, torus field or coherent field from their heart and their hearts are fucking massive is enormous. And so when you talk about what a, you know, a torus field does is a torus field essentially gives us access to nonlinear information in the environment. And so if you, you know, if you're interested, you can check out the heart perception study. Um, it's been conducted, you know, thousands of different ways in thousands of different locations all around the world where, you know, people are essentially, you know, there's one, a great example where people are put in front of a computer and they're shown four different images. And one image is um, like really peaceful and loving. Another image is, you know, a little bit sexual. Another image is a little scary. And then another one is actually quite graphically violent. Um, and when they do this, they, they, they hook people up to, you know, skin sensors, bre- breathing sensors, skin moisture, heart rate variability. You know, they basically uh, ECG, EKG, the whole kit, top to toe, you're basically covered in sensors. Mm-hmm. And so then once they get a baseline for every single picture that they've shown you, they then put the algorithm on and the algorithm then starts to randomly show you different pictures. And even the algorithm doesn't know what picture that it's going to show you. And what's really interesting is there are two organs that respond to the baseline of one of four or all of those pictures before the pictures ever even shown on the screen. And so, you know, for the most part, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the, the data very 
um, objectively and grossly, and I mean high level, whereby mm. let's call it the brain and uh, most of the other senses only reacted to the photos when the photos were present on the screen. But there was one organ in the body that actually precognitively responded to the picture before it was even shown on the screen every single fucking time. And it was the wow. heart. And so the heart, you know, what we know about the heart is it has this, it has this, um, it has this incredible capability to access nonlinear information in its field, you know, and oftentimes it can be referred to, or it can be linked to, you know, our intuition, our, our psychic nature or whatever you want to call it. And so horses, to, and again, to bring it back to the equine, horses are a very intuitive animal. And the reason horses are a very intuitive animal is because they have this huge capability to receive information in their Taurus field, um, mm. which makes them incredibly powerful when it comes to, um, picking up on information from individuals, but also playing out roles based on characters that are in your life. Because your heart has, let's call it 40 million odd neurons. It has an enormous amount of storage capacity for memory. And that's why we see when people get heart transplant, you know, we often, we often hear about, but the mainstream medicine doesn't talk about the heart transplant phenomena, whereby people have a heart transplant and then they wake up with a different personality. They wake up with memories that aren't theirs. They wake up with addictions that aren't theirs. They wake up craving. Like there's one example that I was reading about recently where a lady woke up after heart transplant surgery, craving McDonald's chips. Uh, and for years and years and years, she just craved McDonald's chips. Couldn't understand why, you know, she was disgusted by um, fast food before she went in, but then she tracked down the doctor and tracked down, you know, basically went back to the origin of where did this heart come from and how did the guy die? The guy got T-boned while driving out of a Macca's drive through with a mouthful of fucking Macca's French fries. No you know? And so the heart That's contains an enormous amount of information that is stored memory. And, you know, the heart sends 16 times more information to the brain than the brain sends to the heart. This is a bit of a side note here. So the heart actually is in com communication with the brain way more, 16 times more information from the heart to the brain than the brain to the heart. So the heart is constantly informing us of information in the field. But most people's brains and frontal lobes are so active, they're not listening or they can't sense. Mm -hmm. They're not embodied to be able to sense and, and attune to the information that's coming from the heart because the heart doesn't necessarily speak in words. You know, yeah. The heart speaks in emotions. The heart speaks in sensation. The heart speaks in feelings. The heart has its own central nervous system. The heart has 100,000 times the electrical charge of any other organ in the body. It's this incredible thing. And so when you look at a horse, a horse is basically, you know, it's not a human, but it's very much like a human. It's a mammal. So it's a part of our species. It just doesn't have um, the frontal lobes um, and, you know, many other things as well. So anyway, back to the equine therapy. So when you put yourself in a field full of horses, you have all this stored information in your heart and that's being transmitted in the environment. And so what's so fascinating is the horses start to play out characters in your life. And... Wow. It's amazing because when you go in there, you'll just be hanging out with the horses. And then all of a sudden you'll be hanging out with the horses, hanging out with the horses. And then all of a sudden the horses start to show up in different ways. And it's just like, fuck, you know, and at first you're like, okay, is this just, and thankfully there's an interpreter there. And for the most part, all she does is, you know, she sits back. There's a horse lady there and there's a soc uh, soccer therapist there. Or in my case, that's what was happening. And so that'd sit back and they'd watch things play out. And then they'd come in, you know, every 30, 40 minutes and go, okay, so what was happening there? What were we thinking about there? What was going on there? And after, you know, six weeks of this, I started to realize that all the different horses were playing different characters. Um, and sometimes the horses would change characters, but every single time they'd play a character and they would bring something into the field for me to, to feel. And, you know, oftentimes I'd feel something and then I'd feel a shift in me. And then all of a sudden, as soon as I felt a shift with me, all the horses shifted. And it was just really fascinating to see this level of attunement that these animals have whereby they act as a mirror and they mm. reflect back to you what's going on inside you. And so one day, you know, you'll go, this horse is, oh man, this horse is my favorite. He's really cool. But then the next day he'll be a, a little, not so nice. You know, he'll be a little prick or something. And he'd be like, oh, and oftentimes we'll want to blame the horse. But then, you know, as a part of the therapist, like, what's going on within you that is allowing the horse to show up in that way. And that's not a level of responsibility. You know, if you look at life, and this is where the heart plays such an integral role. You know, most people don't want to look at life as a reflection of what's going on within, with inside them. They want to look at life as something that's happening to them. Yeah. And horses play this incredible role whereby they have this animated reflection of life. They're animating the reflection of whatever you're, whatever, whatever's going on in you, they're going to reflect it back to you. 
And you can either blame the fucking horse or you can blame yourself. And yeah. if you blame the horse, you can't change the fucking horse. If you blame the world, you can't change the world. And it's not even about blame, Danny. It's about responsibility. It's mm-hmm. about having a level of self, self accountability to each moment to be aware of, okay, what is going on inside me right now? What am I feeling right now? Or what am I choosing not to feel? Or what am I using my mind to distract me from feeling? And so, yeah, equine therapy is, is quite profound, but it's very subtle. Like it's not, it's not for, look, put it this way. I wouldn't, I wouldn't throw a massive skeptic in there because they're not going to see anything other than, you know, I don't know. They're just going to see their own reflection, which is they'll be skeptical of themselves. That's incredible. I, I appreciate you sharing that. That's um, super intriguing. I'm, I'm going to spend a decent amount of time after this looking into that further. I think that's Horses, that's mate, horses dogs, kids. Horses, dogs, kids are the are fundamentally three of the most potent reflections in a mammal that, that a human has the opportunity to stand in front of. When you are working, I love working with horses. Like a few years ago, I um, was dating oh, yeah, a few years ago, decades ago, I was dating a girl who, whose uncle was Pat Pirelli and Pat Pirelli back at the time was probably one of the, the very first or second, very well-known world famous horsemen. And by horsemen, I mean horse whisperer. And so he would use nonverbal energetic communication to communicate, work with, and lead a horse. It was absolutely fucking phenomenal. Discovery Channel even did this thing where they, they put him and his crew up against a crew of dirt, back, dirt bike riders. And they said, okay, we, we need you guys to track down the purest bloodlines of Mustangs that you can find in New Mexico. They let the fucking motorbike riders loose. And five days later and four broken legs, they didn't find shit. They let Pat and his team loose. I think it was in the, within four hours, they had found the horses and rounded them up and put them in, put them in their pens. And they did it so quickly that the discovery team weren't there fast enough to film. And so they had to let all the horses go. And so that they could set up the camera so that they could capture them again. And then once he captured, these are horses that have never, for the most part, seen a human, or if they have, they've never had a contact with a human. And then he penned these horses and then one by one, he'd pull them off. And within I think 20 to 30 minutes, he was playing with them like a puppy rolling them on their back, rubbing their belly, a fucking horse. And so what this guy had is this guy had this incredible non-verbal, and I'd even go as far as saying, you know, supported by, but non-physical way of communicating with horses, which which built incredibly powerful trust with wild animals very quickly Mm -hmm. to the point where the wild animals trusted him with their lives. And so I started doing Pirelli, you know, this is going back a few decades ago. And I wouldn't say I was a, I'm a horseman, but I've worked with horses energetically. I started training dogs 20 years ago. I love working with dogs. I've got a, one of the most impeccably trained um, Alsatians that you, you're probably ever going to meet. And I love working with kids, especially my son. And, and some people find this a real, little bit offensive uh, when I say this, but I find kids are just like puppies. And when you look at the neurological structure, there's not a great deal of difference because when you look at a child, a child's frontal lobes don't really start developing until you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, and they don't fully develop until about 28, 29. And a dog and a horse has essentially a very similar brain to a human as a mammal. The only thing it doesn't have is frontal lobes. Mm. And the frontal lobes are essentially responsible for all of the fucking chaos that we, we see in this world today is responsible for those two, those two iterations of evolution. And so when you work with a human puppy or a human kid, <laughs> it's like working with a dog. It's like working with a horse, which means doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you say. If the child doesn't trust you, they're not going to, they're not going to move with you. Same with dogs. Like you can intimidate a dog. You can um, abuse a dog. You can dominate a dog to get it to do what you want. And it will, but give that fucker half a chance. He's going to bite you. You can dominate a child. You can intimidate a child to get it to do what you want it to do. And maybe it will. But that as soon as it becomes equivalent in size, age, you know, muscular strength, you're going to have a fucking rebel on your hands. It's going to fight you. And I don't mean necessarily physically, but I mean mentally, I mean spiritually. I mean, it's going to fight you because you've dominated this animal. You know, you've dominated this species. Whereas if you can learn how to work with a dog energetically, man, that dog will do anything you want it to do because it trusts you. You work with that horse energetically, you know, and, and it builds a level of trust with you. It'll do anything you want it to do. It'll roll over like a fucking dog and let you rub its belly. When you're working with the child, if you can, if the child can feel you energetically, and this is where, you know, when we talk about it in the human context, 
kids speak energy before they speak English or Spanish or Japanese or whatever language that, you know, whoever's listening to this to was their first language. Animals, mammals speak energy. We have these highly attuned, highly sensitive central. And that's one of the things that distinguishes mammals is we have these highly attuned, highly sensitive central nervous systems that makes us. And when you look at what a central nervous system is, it's like a root system through our body that is full of sensors. And so we are mm -hmm. very, very attuned to our environment. Now, due to recent evolution and industrialization, we've become less attuned to our physical selves and the inputs that are coming in and even some of the outputs that are going out. But, um, you know, as mammals, one of the reasons that we've been able to evolve is because we've been able to sense our environment. We've been able to sense non physically present threats. We've been able to sense non physically present opportunities. You know, how the fuck as cavemen, you know, do we know where to go to avoid danger or to find food? You know, there was this sense of innate sixth sense, whatever you want to call it. And so when we look at, I don't even know what the fucking question was. I think we've gone on a, on one of those magical tangents, <laughs> but when we look at, you know, humans or, or animals, or when we look at our, I think it was ourselves. When we look at, yeah, that's what it was. It was when we look at these versions of ourselves being reflected in other mammals uh, yeah it can be pretty confronting but it's an incredible opportunity and that's why oftentimes what people don't realize is when you're working with a child and the child is misbehaving all it's doing in most cases is expressing what is being repressed in the household and oftentimes when that is being repressed in the household it's because there's shame guilt embarrassment whatever so the child then expresses it and so then when that child is expressing what that parent is repressing because that parent is you know ashamed guilty whatever what does the what does the parent put on the child shame guilt oppression yeah. domination how dare you express that thing that i'm very embarrassed about <laughs> yeah and you know we see this with kids we see this with dogs and you know, whenever i look at a, a dog if someone tells me they've got a i don't look at a child and go oh you've got a naughty child i look at the, at the child and go there's something in the environment that is allowing that that is creating a situation where that child is expressing itself that way you know, healthy dogs don't just chew up couches and fucking shit on things and piss all over furniture and attack people. They don't. Anxious dogs do. Yeah. You know, healthy, balanced kids don't misbehave. Anxious kids do. You know, and so when we start looking at the basis of, you know, being a mammal and what creates anxiety, anxiety in most cases is something that is interpreted from the environment. And, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges that we have as humans is we're constantly diagnosing people. We're not diagnosing environments. Mm. Same with disease. You know, people fucking diagnose the disease, but they're not diagnosing the environment where that disease flourished. People diagnose the child, but they don't diagnose, you know, the environment or the system that that child is actually within. And the child is nothing more than a cell, you know, that is within this organization, organism yeah. of life. So many good takeaways from that. And, um, shit, I I'm glad I asked that fucking question now. That was, uh, that was awesome, man. I'm the king really of the tangents. That. <laughs> I love that. Mate. What I'm curious now, like, what do you, what do you gauge success? Like, how do you gauge success? Like, what is your Great definition question. of success for Kerwin at the moment? I'm glad you said at the moment, because I think that is a moving target for most people. Mm. And I think, you know, my definition of success has radically transformed in the last, like I'm 49 this year. And so I'm staring down the barrel of 50. I know I only look like 31, but let's just be kind. Um, I'm 29, but... Thank you, brother. Anytime. But my definition of success has changed. Like I remember as, you know, as growing up, I grew up in a fairly low socioeconomic environment with a single mum who for a long time was on a pension. And so, you know, I grew up in an environment where, you know, we had what I'd call a relatively healthy childhood, which was, you know, kind of offset by a relative level of emotionally abusive situations contained within that. And so I came... I was brought up in an environment where a lot of people's worth was measured by how much money they had and not, yeah. and, but mo most importantly understanding because we had none, but mm -hmm. in our environment, you know, I had a, um, figures in my life, um, that measured the worth of people based on how much money they had. And so that became, I guess you could say an adopted strategy of, uh, value. Yeah. And, you know, if you've got someone in your life who is a, a maternal figure, um, who judges the value of men in their life based on their capacity to make money. And you're a man, you start to go, well, fuck in order for me to be worthy. And then maybe I need to be wealthy. 
And so I started making money very young. Like I started, you know, um, washing cars, mowing lawns, even selling horse shit door to door, um, was one of my first businesses where I actually made some big money. Uh, it's a whole other story. Um, and so for a long time, I had this very strong association between my success being you know, connected to and attached to financial reward or financial capacity. Um, and I still remember, you know, going through school, I sucked at school. I thought I was going to be a professional athlete. And so then, but then at the age of 15, I fell on a broken bottle. Uh, if you can see there, I've got some really big gnarly scars. I cut all my nerves, all my tendons, my main artery nearly bled to death on the side of the road at the age of 15, 13 and a half hours of microsurgery, uh, two blood transfusions and 12 months of rehab. The only thing I can't do now is close my fingers, but for the most part, and it's a little bit of a Shit. mungy hand, but it, it, most people wouldn't know. Um, I was like, oh fuck, I'm not going to be professional athlete now. So I don't know how am I going to make this money? <laughs> and so then I started getting involved in all, all sorts of, you know, little side hustles. And, you know, I did some, some things right. I did some things wrong. Uh, I worked out, I'd say probably by my early late teens, early twenties. Cause by that stage, you know, I'd got into the security industry. I was doing some, some pretty shady shit. Uh, I was doing, you know, I guess you could say unregistered debt collections and you know, violence was a big part of my world, but I knew this wasn't who I was. I knew this yeah. wasn't how my life was going to be. I knew it wasn't. I, I was, it was almost like I remember so many times because I was using drugs at the time as well, but I remember thinking I was living someone else's life. I was like, this isn't my life. This is not how my life is supposed to be going. Mm -hmm. um, and so then I, I moved away and I um, went on this big journey, but again, money, 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 money was this central theme. It was this benchmark. It was this, it was the, it was the, the pillar of value. And then it was around the age of uh, 27, 28, I actually started making money, like proper money. I, I still remember the first year I made proper money. I made like three quarters of a million dollars um, mm -hmm. at the age of 26 or 27. I think I spent like 1.2 on my Amex. Uh, and I went through this, um, this phase of going, okay, now I've got everything that I've always wanted because I've never felt enough because money was missing. But now I've got money. I still feel this emptiness, this void. Yeah. Fuck why? I was like, Oh, you know, I know why it's because you don't have a fucking convertible. So I bought a convertible, <laughs> my two best weeks of my life. I felt amazing. I drove for like eight hours a day around the Gold Coast and my little convertible. And I'm pretty sure there was another guy on the Gold Coast whose name was Wanker who drove the exact same car. Cause every time I drove through the Gold Coast, someone would yell out Wanker. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's cold. And then, um, I thought then two weeks later, at, the, at, at that age when you made that first bit of mate, money, I was, in, I was in, uh, licensing and coaching. And so I was basically okay. working with a guy called Peter Sun and Adam Hudson. And, you know, we, we did, I made them a lot of money in the process of, you know, finding out who I was. Um, but then it was like, okay, I had the car still miserable, bought houses, still miserable, started dating, you know, model girlfriends, still miserable. And I just was like, fuck, I'm still miserable, still miserable, still miserable. And I'm still making all this money. And then I went on this world, I got screwed out of a, um, a business deal quite badly. It was quite traumatic. And I remember going, ah, oh, fuck this. I need to go and find myself because I don't know who I am. You know, I'm 27, 28 years of age. And I still don't know who the fuck I am. And so then I, I walked into the, um, Burley heads flight center and I literally walked in and I was like, okay, where are the most spiritual places on the planet? I didn't tell them I was going to go find myself. And anyway, this, we ended up making this massive list and I went in this eight month, you know, um, pilgrimage around the world, you know, the cradle of life in Africa, spiritual sites in Turkey, Machu Picchu, like all these spiritual spaces, hoping at some point that some fucking Yoda is going to roll out and go, mm, I've been waiting for you. Boonk, and then go, Oh my God, I found me. Uh, never happened. And then I landed in Sydney and then I got kind of taken away from this discovery of self. Although I knew once I landed in Sydney, like it was the moment the, the wheels touched down. I, I, I went to myself, I actually remember thinking to myself, Holy shit, I've been looking in the wrong place because I was looking out there and I was like, fuck, mm. I think it's actually in here, but still nothing changed. Money, money, money was the benchmark. Money was the benchmark. And then I started making, you know, big money and started banking big money. And again, it's not how much money you make, it's how much money you keep. And, you know, I remember getting to this point where, you know, I would open my, my banking app, you know, sometimes, um, a couple times a month. And I think at one stage I had like 12 million net in my bank account and I'd just sit there and I go, fuck man, you've done it. You've made it. But I still felt like something was missing. Um, and then, yeah, then things started to change. You know, I, 
Uh, I got divorced, uh, which was heart, absolutely heartbreaking at, for me at the time. Like it was warranted. It was probably required. Uh, you know, I fought really hard for that relationship, um, but it just wasn't enough. Um, and then I became, you know, then in the context that I became a dad. And as soon as I became a dad, everything shifted, like everything shifted. The whole focus on money was still there, but I started realizing I had this, um, capacity to love that I'd never experienced before. Cause, and I think if I'm really honest, I don't think I ever really loved anybody until I had a son. And there was this expansion of love that was just so great. And then we went through this divorce and, you know, at first it was really shocking and really upsetting, but then all of a sudden I was a single dad. And I don't say that in a bad way. I say this in a great way because man, being a single dad, holy shit, what a fucking great opportunity to be the dad you want to be. Because I think in any dynamic, you know, there's always going to be input from both people. But when you're a solo parent, you get to be the parent you want. And no one can tell you how to parent, you know, because you're, you're solo. And so this, this relationship grew and this love grew and this, this motivation grew. Like, and I still remember when I found out my Noah's mum was pregnant, man, I worked, I got more done in nine months of that pregnancy than I've ever got done in my entire life before. I transformed the model of my business. I transformed the delivery to my clients. I transformed, you know, the revenue model, the profit model, everything based on this, um, preparation for this child. But then the child came and this love came and this expansion came and, you know, then the divorce came and then this, I guess you could say this transformation took place that was, you know, let's call it 50 parts fucking really traumatic and sad because I did, it's not what I wanted. But then on the other hand, it was 51 point, you know, five parts beautiful because then I got to be this dad that I always wanted. And then my definition of success slowly started to change. It slowly started to shift and it became more about spending time with my son and more about, you know, making memories with him and like, I still remember one time, you know, I, I think I, I think I've been in two relationships since I split up with Noah's mum, And the first relationship was like six weeks. And, you know, after, after six weeks, I was like, okay, we'd booked a, you know, this romantic holiday to Bali together. And I remember like a week out going, nah, this isn't going to work, but I'd already paid like fucking 20 grand on this holiday. And I took my son. <laughs> it was, it was incredible, you know? And so that to me started to really recalibrate what success meant. Um, and so success to me started to go from being financially measured, but then I started to measure my success based on who my son was becoming mm -hmm. because there was so much of myself that was going into my son and I was seeing this little human develop and, you know, whether you're a PT or a coach or anyone who's interested in helping people or developing people like, man, when you're a, when you're a parent, man, it is the it is the ultimate training ground for a coach. It is the ultimate training ground for a PT. It is the ultimate training ground for anyone who wants to fucking help people because you get a client full time <laughs> and their entire expression of life is for the most part, you, we couldn't try and blame DNA and genetics and everything else. But for the most part, it is a reflection of the environment that you have created for them. So you want to know how good you are as a fucking coach. Show me how your kids behave. You know, mm. show me how your kids show up in challenge. Show me how your kids show up in reward. Show me how your kids show up in a range of different scenarios. And that to me will show you, are you a good coach? And so for me, I started to look at my son and all these different expressions, and all these different ways. And I started to, and I, I, I'm his dad. I'm going to fucking love him regardless. But then I started, you know, then, then the extrinsic reflection started coming back. People go, oh my God, your son is just incredible. Oh my God, your son is just such a grateful person. Oh my God, your son is just such an incredible leader. Um, and I started to go, fuck. Oh. And then I started to go, man, this is, this is, this is a feeling that you can't get from money. Right. Yeah. And so I started to feel this level of success that was coming from the product. And look, maybe this is, you know, I don't care what it is. I just started to realize that my, the definition of success went from being not so much how much money I had, but to how I was parenting my son and how he was expressing himself. And again, like, could be dangerous because once he reached teenage, once he reaches the teenage years, he could turn into a bit of a prick for a period of time. And I don't <laughs> want to judge my success based on that, but look, <laughs> it's fair to say that that could be coming. 
but then I got, um, sick, you know, cause I had a stroke yeah. back in 2009, you know, pre-marriage, pre, pre kids, you know, to me, it was a fucking amazing experience. I had a near death experience. loved it. But the stroke that I had end of 2021 was horrible. Like I had it with my son. We were at home by ourselves. Like I had, you know, almost full paralysis down the left hand side. I was drooling on myself and my son was present. And so that was a lot for him to deal with. And um, my recovery was fucking horrible. And I won't get into the details of it because I'll, I'll spare um, the privacy of the environment that I was in at the time. But I was, I was in an environment and a situation that just wasn't healthy for me. Um, and so my recovery was just fucking horrible. It was really bad. Um, and so as a result, I didn't get better. I got worse and I got worse and I got worse and I got worse. And, you know, there was a, a few things that happened. You know, uh, we had, a, 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 I was in a relationship, we had an unexpected pregnancy um, and then we had the birth and there was a lot of things that were going on and I just got kept on continually getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, and then when I fully crashed, I fully bottomed out. I fully, like I, I mate, Danny, I dead set thought if I don't kill myself and then my body's going to do it for me because the, the, the space that I'm in, the mindset that I'm in, the intent and the energy that was coming from here into here was just so fucking destructive. I was like, well, if I don't end my life, then my body's going to do it for me because, you know, there's no physical organism that could put up with this level of stress without, you know, having some severe consequences. But then I started getting healthy again. You know, I started having these moments where my health started to return, but there was this one moment in particular where I didn't see my son Noah for six weeks. And, um, because I just, I didn't have the capacity, like I had no executive function. Mm. I was very unwell. I had no energy, you know, I was a bag of bones basically. Um, and I became very overwhelmed very quickly. And so I didn't see, I was in a six week recovery. I came back for a couple of weeks. I hadn't seen my son at this point, maybe eight weeks, but I was speaking to him every day on the telephone, FaceTime. And then one day I rang him and we were talking and he just burst into tears. Uh, and he's like, daddy, where are you? And I'm, I'm like, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm in Byron. He goes, well, how come I can't see you? I said, oh, daddy's just, you know, daddy's had the stroke. He's still getting better. He goes, but I just don't even know if you're real anymore. I just want my dad back. Man. And he, he went on this full meltdown and I don't mean meltdown tantrum, like meltdown where he was just beside himself and he kept on saying, I just want my dad back. I just want to see my dad. And it was at that point I realized this could have been the moment where, you know, he found out I died or, you know, something had happened. And, and so then, you know, I, I went on this huge trajectory of, you know, it was in that moment, a lot of things changed. I started to really become a lot more focused on my recovery. And that was a huge moment of that shift. But then as I started to, and this is the thing with depression and I'd never understood this before and I could never relate to it, but I'd always support people who, you know, who I'd work with that had had depression, but I never understood it. Like when you're in that space, you know, there's, when I was in that space, there was nothing I could do that would get me out of it. There was nothing. And I'd been depressed at one stage for about seven or eight months, every fucking day, obsessively, obsessively thinking about how I was going to end my life. Um, Shit. from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to bed, like obsessed with it. And then I remember my very first good day and it was like, I woke up and I was like, oh my God, I'm fixed. Oh my God. And then one of my mates said to me, mate, when you have a good day, hold on to it. Like hold on to that feeling. And I remember like thinking, ah, oh, it's fine. I'm, I'm fixed now. And that's what I learned. There's a difference between, um, feeling better, getting better and staying better. Yeah. And it starts with feeling better. And I remember I felt great for a day and the next two weeks I was fucking back in deep depression again. But then after two weeks I had another good day and I was like, Oh my God, this is amazing. And I'm still answering your question here. And then I had like two good days in a row and I was like, Oh my God. And then I started to really memorize. What does this feel like? What does this feel like? What does being happy feel like? What does feeling good feel like? What does, you know, not being depressed feel like? And then I remember, you know, then I'd go back and it was like, you know, pr progression is never a straight line. Like progression is really, yeah. it looks like this. And that's what my recovery was like. It was like, you know, sometimes it was one step forward, one step back. Sometimes it was 10 step forwards, five step back. Sometimes it was 10 step forward, 15 steps back, but there was always a, a progression towards something. And then when I started to feel good, I remember just thinking to myself, fuck, I don't want to make a hundred million dollars anymore. 
I just want to be happy. And so now when you know, I look at the evolution of my benchmark of success, my, my measure of success now is just being happy. Like it really is, you know, and some days are more successful than others. And, you know, mm -hmm. touch wood, God forbid, you know, I haven't dipped back into depression now since probably January or February. I've had a couple of bad days, like where I'm like, Oh fuck, remember this? And it's like, Oh shit. You know, and it's just a, a nice little reminder, but touch wood. Yeah. I'm free and clear now since about February this year. Um, and oh my God, there's just so much to be said for the feeling of being happy for no particular reason, you know, cause I think oftentimes what we're looking for is we're looking for a reason to be happy, mm. you know? Uh, and I know for me, I tied for a long time, my happiness was tied to my son, you know, and his expression. Um, and maybe in some respects it still is to, to a level cause I'm just so fucking proud of him. And my, my new son, Jonah, I'm so proud of both of my kids, but now, and I've discovered that there's a, a lot, to be gained from just learning how to be happy in a moment for no reason. Like just, for no, just literally be in a moment and feel the body, feel the sensation and just go, Oh, I'm at peace. I'm happy. I'm healthy. That's what it's all about. Right. And then two seconds later, you're thinking about, you know, whatever. <laughs> so yeah, but being happy in the absence of a reason is, is a huge benchmark for me now huge thanks so much for sharing man i appreciate that so much that's uh all of your answers have been absolutely incredible to be, to just to let you know um that was awesome mate i want to be mindful and respectful of your time um but but i feel like my audience would be filthy with me if i didn't ask um at least one of these questions so i want to kind of finish this off and again this could be a loaded question and it might be the shittest one to ask at the end of the episode but i'm going to do it anyway um for someone listening at the moment um who is is looking to scale their business, regardless of whether that's online, whether it's a um, you know brick and mortar, whatever it may be. What are the questions or the question that everyone should be asking themselves and people within the business before they make the decision to try and um, you know massively scale their business? Hmm. Because I feel like I've been kind of experiencing this a little bit lately um, in terms of, you know, I do high ticket online coaching, a mixture between fitness and mindset. And, and I started working with my coach a, a few months ago. Um, I've had a number of them now, but we, we looked at kind of scaling the business um, in comparison to what I was doing before. And I feel like I've been having this conversation with myself over this last week or two, starting to ask myself, do I actually want to scale it yeah. to the point where That's we've actually where we've actually set this target. Like, do I even want that? It's a really good question. I think you answered your own question almost there, Danny. Um, like <clears throat> I think when people want to scale, like oftentimes they don't understand what scale means. Um, you know, I think we understand maybe the basic terminology it means to grow, but at what cost, what consequence, what sacrifice, you know, I think one of the most important questions that people need to ask themselves is what type of life do I want to have? You know, and where am I, you know, what type of life do I want to have and where, and maybe first, what stage of life am I in right now? You know, cause I'm 49. And so it's fair to say, you know, I don't have dozens of startups left in me. You know, I've, I've only really got a, a few things I want to do with my life right now when it comes to, you know, my entrepreneurial endeavors, but you know, what stage of life am, am I in, but what type of life do I want? And this is where for me, you know, understanding scale is not necessarily just about growth. And I say this at my events because my specialty is scale and, you know, I've generated in excess of well over a billion dollars in top line results for my clients just in the last 10 years. And so I'd like to think, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at it. Um, and there's a range of reasons why I think I'm pretty good at it and results is certainly number one. But when we look at scale, scale to me, when we look at the definition of scale in my book, in based on Kerwin's Webster is scale equals freedom. And so for me, scale isn't about building necessarily a hundred million dollar business or building a business that has a hundred team members. Scale might just be building a business that has three team members. that doesn't require you to be there and you can make, you know, a hundred, 150, 250, half a million dollars a year. Um, and so to me, when you know what type of life that you want, you know, what type of scale you're going after. 
you know, because for me, as I said, scaling for one person is different to scaling for someone else. You know, I've got clients that you know are doing an excess of 50 and a hundred million dollars and their idea of scale right now is streamlining. It's, Mm -hmm. um, you know, removing complexity. It's focusing on profitability. It's, you know, it's not necessarily about taking a business from a hundred million to 200 million. It's going, okay, how do we take this hundred million dollar business and put it under management? So it runs with two hours of my input every single week. And that is the, that's really my jam. My jam is by, is really working with business owners to help them grow, but at the same time, giving them their life back. And I think that's lost. A lot of that is lost in, you know, let's call it the, I think we're kind of moving into the post hustle culture. Um, you know, but I think a lot of the hustle culture is me, 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 me. And it's very much, a, you know, I need to do everything and, and maybe for some, it's not, or I need to be out work. I need to be the hardest working motherfucker in the room. And I just think uh, it's such a poor measure of success. Uh, Cause if you're the hardest working person in the room, chances are you're probably the fucking stupidest because to me, you know, one of our values in our organization is we work smarter, not harder. And, you know, in order to work smarter, not harder, you need time. You know, there are five stages of growth in a business. There are five stages of scale. And when you reach the pinnacle of scale, the pinnacle of scale is what I call the creative phase. And very few people actually achieve the creative phase. And the creative phase is, is stage five in the sequence. It's preceded by obviously four other stages and starts up in the startup. It starts in the startup stage, uh, but it is it basically, um, you know, it, the, 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 the peak is, is the creative stage. And what makes the creative stage work is is two elements. It's time and space. Because if you don't have time and space, you can't be creative. And I know there are some people out there that can be incredibly creative without time and space. But when I look at, you know, some of the best creatives, and I'm talking some of the most incredible genius minds on the planet, it's because in in some way, shape or form, they've been able to create a vacancy of time and space that enables them to be creative. You know, you look at Warren Buffett, who for a long time was kind of held up as the, you know, the icon investor and he is in so many different ways but he would spend 80 percent of his time every single week just reading reading and Mm. thinking reading and thinking reading balance sheets reading financial reports and thinking oh if i acquired that company could i you know could i create distribution within my other um i know mark zuckerberg when i wrote one of his first book or not his first book someone wrote a book about him called zuck And they talked about how he essentially had, I don't know if he adopted it from Buffett, but he adopted a principle, same thing. 80% of his time every week was invested in reading and thinking, like literally isolating himself from his office Mm -hmm. environment, reading and thinking. And the other 20%, 10% was internal meetings and the other 10% was external, external meetings. And so for me, you know, the, the, the greatest benefit that, any entrepreneur can add to their business is by having enough time to think about how to make it better, but also enough contact within the business to see where it can be made better. And so when you look at most of our clients that we work with, you know, we have a number of our clients that we've taken completely out of their businesses, um, you know, and, and made them, you know, under management sale ready. And this is something that a lot of people don't realize or nor understand is a business is more valuable if it doesn't require you to be there. Like if yeah. you look at the trade value of a business in Australia, you know, you're looking at a, a, a an earnings multiple of, you know, about 1.5 to three times profit will be the valuation of a business. And so if you've got a, let's call it a business can be in any category. It's making, let's say it's making a million dollars a year, but it's profiting net EBITDA of half a million dollars a year. So that business is going to be worth, you know, th- let's call it at the top end three times that. Okay. So it's going to be worth anywhere between 750,000 to 1.5 million for trade sale, right? You take that same business and this is where a lot of people don't realize the value in flipping businesses is actually quite high because, you know, if you flip a property, you can go and you can buy a property, you renovate the, you know, the kitchen, the bathroom, the landscaping, and, you know, you can make yourself a, a quick hundred, 120 grand, but you're never going to be able to out, that property though will never outperform uh, the value of the market. It'll never outperform the value mm. of uh, the suburb. Whereas, and a lot of people will type, you know, significant amounts of capital in a hundred to two hundred thousand dollar return on flipping a property. And it's like, fuck, man. When you consider what you can do with a business, you can go into a business, you know. And I've had clients that have done this where they'll buy, you know, they'll spend, let's call it, you know, there's a same business. I'll just use this as an example. You know, it's got a million dollars in turnover. It's got a profit 
EBIT of 500,000, you know, they buy it for, let's call it one 750,000. Um, but then what they do is instead of renovating, you know, the bathroom and the kitchen and the and landscaping, you know, they renovate the planning process, they renovate the marketing process, they renovate the sales process, they renovate the financials, mm -hmm. they renovate the leadership and the culture. And now you have a business that might be doing, I don't know, maybe it's doing $1.3 million. Okay. And maybe it's got an EBIT of $600,000, but now it's under management. It's only mm -hmm. doing an extra hundred thousand dollars in profit, but because that business is now under management, you're not selling a business anymore. You're now selling an asset class. And so now that business is potentially worth three times that. So now you've got a business that you bought yeah, for seven, right. you know, let's call it 750,000. It's now worth 1.8 million. You can do that in six months. Yeah. And you can't get that, those kind of capital gains from property, you know, unless you're doing development and you've done many, 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 many more before. And so for me, when I'm scaling a business, you've got to ask yourself the question is what type of life do I want? You know, and what stage of life am I in? Because if you're, you know, let's call it over 50, you may not want to hustle, but there is a level of hustle that is required. Um, if you want to put your business under management, but if you want a life that enables you to do what you want, when you want, and you've got an ATM on demand. Okay. There's got to be a plan. Okay. Businesses don't scale by accident. They scale based on a very specific process of planning. And when we look at what, when I look at what we do as a skill set in terms of scaling businesses, one of the key things that makes what I do work is really thorough planning. And I'm not talking about, you know, 23 page thick, plans that you take to a business that you take to a bank to get, you know, finance. I'm talking about really strategic plans, which are nothing more than in most cases, a one to two page document that are fundamentally strategic at a very high level, but fundamentally underpinned by very strong tactical outcomes. And so it's, it's not wordy, you know, it's not full of language. It's just full of tactical outcomes. What is the strategic intent? You know, what are we trying to do at a high level and what are the tactical objectives that need to be executed? Right. What's first, how do we prioritize the priorities to get shit done? And then over time, that's where you can take a business, you know, and you can grow it, but at the same time, you can put it under management while you're growing it. And so not only are you increasing, uh, the enterprise value of the organization, you're also increasing, you know, the, the trade value as well. And that to me is, you know, the greatest accomplishment is by the end of your time or your tenure, you've got a business that is now an asset class. Okay. It's not a mm. ongoing concern that requires an owner and operator because that's going to limit your acquisition. That's going to limit your buyer's market. Whereas if you've just got a business that runs and has been running for three years under management, man, your, your market for capital and, and being able to sell that is just opened up dramatically. Uh, and I just don't think a lot of people really think about that. And you know, I work in you know, my main business. I've got a number of businesses, but my main business is, you know, the, let's call it the Kerwin Ray brand. But what most people don't realize is what drives my business is a model of, you know, mentoring on scale. But what's most interesting, what most people wouldn't realize is my business isn't a guru model. How is it that I could take a year off? If I was a guru model, there's no way I could have a stroke and take a year off and come back to an eight figure business. Show me anyone in a personality brand that can have a fucking severe brain injury, heart surgery, take 12 months off and come back to something other than a car park. I don't know how many there would be. But the reason that my model works is because, first of all, my model is not a guru model. My model is a community model. It's based on um, community initiatives, community management, community leadership. So everything is community led, community managed, community directed. It's not Kerwin led, Kerwin managed, Kerwin yeah. directed. It is a massive transference of knowledge and a massive transference of responsibility. And as a natural consequence of that, it creates an incredibly um, capable community of individuals that are far more capable than most other communities. Why? Because they're not being fucking spoon fed by a parent. They're being, yep. you know, empowered and they're being led, you know, and they're being you know, educated at the same time. And so for me, one of the reasons that, you know, I came back to an eight figure business after, after a severe brain injury was because I'd been planning for that for five years, five years, like five, I think it was 2016. I went, okay, key person risk me. How does this business operate without me? So for 
for six years or oh, seven, almost six, seven years prior to me having the stroke, I'd been working on getting me out of the business. But it's a guru model. No, it's not. It just looks like it is. I've just got a, I'm just lucky I have a relatively good personality. You know, even though I've got, you know, a pretty rough head, I can string sentences together <laughs> most well, <laughs> pretty well. Um, Good example. Yeah. Like I'm, mate, I failed every single subject from year one to year 12. You know, so everything's a bonus from here. Kerwin, mate, I uh, can't thank you enough. Honestly, I, I really, really enjoyed our conversation today. And I know the the community of the Fitness and Lifestyle podcast will thoroughly enjoy it and take away so much value. And I would absolutely bloody love to sit down with you again at some point. Um, would love to catch up in person at some point as well um, and record another episode for the podcast because today has been incredible. And um, Thank you, brother. I just want to express my gratitude to you and, and everything that you've done and continue to do. And also, obviously, for your time today and, and sharing this much value. Um, I'm so glad the podcast went in the direction that it did and I know the audience is going to absolutely froth it, mate. So I, I really appreciate your time. Mate, Danny, thank you so much for having me. Guys, I know you have all absolutely loved this episode. Um, so if that is you, please do take a screenshot of this episode, share it on your social media or share the link um, of this episode with someone that you care about or know would be able to take some value away from today's chat. And we look forward to chatting to you on next week's episode of the Fitness and Lifestyle Podcast. 